Hello, I'm Magali Laguerre-Wilkinson, and this is Science and You. We're coming to you from City College's newest edition, the Center for Discovery and Innovation. The American Museum of Natural History has much to share and even more not on display. Andrew Falzone heads behind the scenes at the museum's big bone room and cryogenics lab to get a sneak peek at what's not being shown, for now. You would think at a museum as well known and well regarded as the American Museum of Natural History that all of the good stuff would be on display. A lot of it is, but the museum's entire collection includes over 33 million specimens, every kind of animal, mineral, rock, bone, and cultural artifact you could imagine. Since all of that stuff takes up an area over 2 million square feet, not all of it is readily available for public viewing. I could be in here just in this single room forever and find interesting things about every single specimen. Carl Melling is a senior museum specialist and the single room he's talking about is every eight-year-old's dream, a room filled with giant dinosaur bones. It's known as the Big Bones Room and for good reason. Its larger residents tip the scales at over 700 pounds, which is why that forklift is nearby to help move things around. The giant sliding shelves help make more space in a room that holds the remnants of some of the largest animals that ever walked the earth. Pick, what we have is the specimens are all on pallets for the most part on the shelves and when a researcher needs to work with these I'll pull it off the shelf with the pallet, the, the forklift and put the pallet right on the floor for them to work with. The assortment of fossils includes backbones and skulls and even giant footprints that were left in the mud hundreds of millions of years ago. Most of the items in the room are parts of incomplete skeletons and so they're more valuable to researchers than they are on display. In fact, some of them are still in their original plaster from research expeditions over a century ago. A lot of times I'll have people in here and they're like, how come that's still wrapped up? Because they'll see on it, it says 1947 or even farther back all the way to the 1890s. And that's, um, that's because it's, there are, it's very easy to teach people how to dig and go into the field and you always have a lot of people who are interested in doing that. Um, but then when it comes here and the slower, more meticulous excavation work goes on, there are very, very few people who have the right temperament to do that, and there's very few people that actually do it. And even though the Big Bones Room is not open to the public, the museum wanted to give people a peek inside, and so they created a similar exhibit, and having been inside the room, we thought it was pretty accurate. And the spaces you see on the wall behind me are the specimens that came out and went on to the, into the display, and they replicate this room. It's like one of the first views we have on, from, you know, display perspective of how things are stored in the collections and what it really looks like behind the scenes. So it looks just like this, and specimens that were right here are now up there on the, the fourth floor. The Big Bone Room houses some of the museum's largest behind-the-scenes specimens. Our next stop is a room that houses some of the museum's smallest, and to say they're cool would be an understatement. Also off limits to the public is the Ambrose Monell Collection for Molecular and Microbial Research, and that might not be so bad since there's not much to see with the naked eye. Svetlana Katanova is the collection manager, and so far the museum has amassed quite a collection. We're potentially the largest, the most in the, uh, comprehensive initiative of its kind, capacity to store one million tissue samples. The first step is receiving and meticulously preparing the sample for storage. Here a lab technician is working to extract some RNA and DNA samples from a fish scale. The materials are then stored in giant cryogenic liquid nitrogen freezers until they're needed for research. These are LN2 freezers. Um, they're passive. So let's say if within, uh, if there's a power outage one month, month, they can stay on themselves without human intervention. And the temperatures inside the freezer are downright frigid at negative 160 degrees Celsius. Working with liquid nitrogen and in temperatures that cold can actually cause suffocation. And of course, coats, gloves, and goggles are necessary to prevent frostbite. We need to open up a vat, find the rack, pull the rack out. This is where the samples are. And since it's possible to store so many samples in such a small space, the museum believes its cryogenic collection is the largest collection of biodiversity on the planet, and it plans to continue to expand. Last year alone, 100,000 new samples were added. I'm Andrew Falzone for Science and You. Tired of dealing with chronic pain? It turns out snails might be able to help. Tina Beth Pina has the story. 
And so nature is the cure because these peptides have been tested for millions of years. Mandy Halford, an associate chemistry professor at Hunter College, researches the peptides found in snail venom, which have been proven to be powerful painkillers. Right now, currently, it's been used to uh, treat chronic pain in HIV and cancer patients. The wonderful thing is that it's not just a one-trick pony. Each snail can produce somewhere between 100 to 250 different peptides in its venom cocktail, in its arsenal, and each of these has the potential to treat drugs. Currently, there are several other peptides that are on the market that are in different trials and therapeutic development for treating pain. Researchers have already harnessed one FDA-approved drug based on the venom. Prealt is approved. It's an FDA-approved drug that's been approved since 2004 in the U.S. and subsequently after in Europe and worldwide. And it's being used on patients currently where morphine is no longer an option. It's similar to morphine, but it doesn't have the addictive side effect because it doesn't work on opioid receptors. And it does have a major drawback in that you have to take a spinal tap to deliver it. So the use is limited right now because of the delivery method. So in the lab, what we're trying to do is figure out ways to deliver um, the pre that are less invasive. So is this, in a sense, one way to help fight our nation's opioid crisis? We're in that crisis because a lot of drug companies know one way in which to treat pain or one predominant way, which is using morphine. And morphine's great, it's effective, but you know it's addictive. This is what's happening currently, right? Causing trauma to a lot of families and a lot of people. And why this drug is important is because it demonstrated that we don't have to use opioids to treat pain. We can use something that is non-addictive. In this case, it's an N-type calcium channel, which is found, and, and it's a very selective thing where we shut off the pain. And so this is important because we basically can save lives. We can, we can alter the way in which um, pain is treated if we use the venom from these snails. Snails hunt their prey by paralyzing them with a venom from a harpoon-like tooth. Scientists have been harnessing this venom, and its continued research will create new pathways for pain treatment. There's a lot of modern technology, um, genomics, um, uh, mass spectrometry, all of these things that have come online that enable us to investigate venomous animals that before were too small or hard to, to get. Now we are able to do that. So we have both a rise in technology, we have interest from pharmaceutical companies, and we also have interest in the scientific world where a host of scientists can work collaboratively to use venom to build better drugs for society. Clinical trials with human subjects could be the next step for scientists in the coming years, which would hopefully make a non-addictive pill available for people suffering from chronic pain. For Science and You, I'm Tina Beth Pina. Fruit flies are not the first thing you think about when talking about your health. But it turns out these little critters have a lot more information about our biology than we'd want to think about or than we would know, especially in space. So joining us to explain all of this mystery is Dr. Shubha Govan. Dr. Govan, thank you so much for joining us. And, and, and tell me, what is it about fruit flies in space? Well, um, first of all, thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk about our work to the general audience. Um, this is not the first time that fruit flies have been to space. Uh, this is one of the third or the fourth experiments that uh, we have sent to space as a, as a group. But the first experiment from my lab uh, that has gone to space. And what is interesting about this experiment is that in addition to the fruit flies, we've also sent its parasite. Its parasite? With it. Oh, with it, okay, yes. okay. And so explain that a bit further. What is, what, was it because you, the results from these previous trips uh, uh, yielded something that made you curious to send parasites along the next, the next round, is that yeah. why? Absolutely, that was the right reason. So previous experiments, uh, work of other people, ha has shown that the innate immune system or the immune system of the fly is compromised in, in space flight, as is the immune system of astronauts. So we thought that we would build on this knowledge uh, from previous experiments, and this time, instead of just sending the fruit flies, send a natural parasite along with it to see if it would actually develop in space just the way it develops in, la in the lab, for example. Which is what, which is what we have here. Um, but, but tell me, what, what is it about, uh, I'm, I, it's my understanding, I should say, that the short lifespan of a fruit fly is what makes this type of study even more interesting because you can do multiple generations. Is that right? Do I have that correct? Yes, you do. Um, indeed, that is the case. So fruit flies are one of the 
uh, oldest model organisms. We've been studying them for over a century and we have a lot of knowledge base built from the study. And um, so not only is it easy to uh, grow them, they are inexpensive to grow, they are very prolific, they have a lot of babies, um, and they grow in a very small space. As you can see, for example, the vials actually that we sent to the spaces are even smaller than these. So, um, so because of this knowledge base, we want to take advantage of how we can leverage this, this uh, you know, source of information to understand space physiologies, human physiology, using the fly as a model organism. A model organism is one which can be used as a stand-in or a proxy for human health and human condition in space flight. And, and you're talking about human health because when I think of a fruit fly, I think of a nuisance. Yeah. I, I think of swatting, and I think millions of other people uh, think the same. But how is it a benefit to human health? What is it yielding? What type of information? What have you discovered from them? So, um, importantly, the, uh, the genome size of the fruit fly is about 5% that of the human genome. Yeah. But the number of genes that it has is about the same as in the human genomes. The Tell me this again. Yeah. The so the number of genes is uh, roughly 15,000 in the fruit fly. So that is all the genes that we know of that exist in the fruit fly genome is 15,000. And all the genes that we know of in the human genome is about 22 to 25,000. Wow. And, and more importantly, there are many uh, counterparts of the fly genes in the human genes. So we can study you know, we can actually literally take the human genes and put them in the fly genome and study them in the, in the fly, or conversely, we can just study the, the analogs or the homologs of the human genes in the fly. So there was, there was a recent study in which the DNA of the twin astro astronauts, um, Scott and Mark Kelly, uh, th their DNA was analyzed and it, and it showed, it yielded, or at least the reports are saying that the one who had spent all this time at the International Space Station, his DNA was slightly altered when he came back to Earth. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how true that is or if the jury's still out on that, but can you talk a little bit about, about, this, uh, about the study of twins? So, um, indeed, that is a fascinating study. We're all waiting for the results to be published. Being a twin myself, I'm very interested in, <laughs> in what happened and how, I think they studied various parameters, different labs studied various parameters in, 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 uh, in the body, in, in, the, in the physiology of the body. And I think the, the work is still being analyzed and we're still waiting for the results. But in the meantime, it's all about the fruit flies. Of course. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Govind. I really appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Govind has also discovered that fruit flies suffer from inflammation. Because of that, they've now become a good model for studying inflammatory disease in humans. Science in you tests your knowledge. Do you know the answer? What layer of the Earth's atmosphere makes radio communications possible? A. Troposphere B. Stratosphere C. Ionosphere or D. Exosphere The answer, ionosphere. The ionosphere consists of free electrons and ionized atoms in which radio waves reflect off of, making communication possible. Additionally, the ionosphere grows and shrinks between 30 miles above the surface to about 600 miles above the surface, based on solar conditions. It's been a long wait, but it's finally starting to feel like summer. With the joys of spending time outside, there's the caveat of more bugs hanging around your barbecue or other outdoor hangouts. One good way to eliminate these pests, which may not seem obvious, is to consider some special plants for your outdoor space. Carol Ann Riddell has more. Don Gable is the director of plant health at the New York Botanical Garden, and he's not just describing his ideal garden based on looks. It turns out you can design a garden to repel insects. So I would tend to make a mixture, go a little crazy. Maybe have some onions in your flower garden. There's some beautiful ornamentals. And then I would include plants like this. You could bring them out and incorporate this sort of mixed garden approach in your sitting area. And again, the closer you keep it to where you are, 
the more effect you might get. Some plants are very good at uh, repelling uh, certain insects. So uh, farmers would use them in a in what we call intercropping. So we have our primary crop, that is what we want, whatever we're yes. growing, wheat, corn, or something like that. And there would be another plant that would be repellent to a certain insect that really bothers that crop that a farmer would have to spend a lot of money on sure. to control. So if he plants them in there, the insect is going to be repelled. Gable says that same idea of intercropping that farmers apply within their crops can be applied to more urban areas using a variety of plants. There's lots of different types of lavender, but these are things that might be uh, for garden type insects, aphids and the likes, those kinds of uh, insects that come and go. But if they're going to come to this plant, they're going to be repelled. They're not going to want to adapt to that smell that they're getting. We might not even smell it, but the insects do. We have basil. This isn't your sweet basil that we know so well, but these are two other types of basil that could be used. And this is a very strong smelling, as we know, and is a great insect repeller for a variety of insects. We have lantana. That's a common plant that's used during the summer outdoors or indoor plant, but uh, commonly put out in hanging baskets. And this, again, has a very pungent odor, especially when it's bruised. So the glands release their volatile oils, essential oils, and the insects are gonna wanna stay away from that. These essential oils are chemical compounds released by the plants as a defense mechanism. And while the odor of these oils keeps bugs away, they smell good to us. And the most interesting thing about these volatiles might be the way they communicate with other plants through crosstalk. Plants can actually communicate with each other through these same types of volatiles. These um, oils. These oils, right, I'm sorry, that will become volatile. Sometimes they're not oils, that there are other substances very closely related that the plant forms for its plant defenses. So we have this crosstalk where plants can talk to each other in this manner. Also, once plants are attacked by an insect, they may release certain volatiles there that tell adjoining plants, hey, I'm under attack. You should get your defenses stimulated. And it's not just herbs that repel insects. Many vegetables and floras, like radishes, garlic, lemongrass, citronella grass, and marigolds all have that positive effect as well. Plants are great. They're, um, the flowers, the foliage are going to uh, put people in a good mood. It's been proven that trees and streets are a great way for people to feel better about themselves. They take away some of the harshness of our urban environments. So it's a feel good thing and it's very real. It's palpable that you can sort of have that. Plus I always say to people, you know, they're making oxygen for us all the time. So we have that benefit, almost a, an air freshener, pumping out oxygen every day for you in your house or in your area. So uh, lots of purposes, uh, multiple purposes that we could incorporate them in our garden and use them in other places. Gable says using a variety of insect repelling plants won't necessarily create a 100% bug free environment, but it can help. Other tips, avoid standing water in your gutters and elsewhere. Also create a nice breeze, for example, using fans. You may just find your outdoor space is beautiful and home to fewer unwanted guests. I'm Carol Ann Riddell for Science and You. Having a disability is a daily struggle, and there are plenty of tools to help make things a little easier. Take the walking stick, for example, for the visually impaired. But such a large cane can be troubling for visually impaired toddlers. So, in steps Hunter College. Here's how they've been able to help. Researching my book on the history of blind children, it became clear that there were four common delays that were seen as separate and apart from each other. The first obvious one is the, is the motor delay. They don't walk as early, and when they do walk, they have um, body positioning problems. Then it's concepts, they lack concept, and they don't develop concepts as well, which affects their language and their social skills. Grace Ambrose-Sakin from Hunter College discovered that a lot of the delays these toddlers experience are attributed to stress which could be lessened if the children experience safer mobility. This led her to inventing a new device that is helping visually impaired toddlers reach their milestones. This little child has to think of everything about how can I try to move through this world. So I can't think about language, and I can't think about social, and I can't think about anything other than trying to accomplish this very stressful act. 
they can't operate a normal cane. Even adults need a lot of training to operate a long cane. A toddler, a toddler can't, can't hold a doll for five minutes. They're not going to have the capacity. It's unre unrealistic to expect them to operate a long white cane in a way that's effective. Other tools that were available to them were like push cart toys and other things that were useful, but they weren't really a great solution. It hit me, you know, what if we could have a hands-free what if we could make a developmentally appropriate mobility tool? That's when Grace started making prototypes of her walking canes in her garage. She would test her prototypes with her neighbor's visually impaired children, whom she was tutoring at the time. Oh my goodness, it worked perfect! Once she saw that her prototype worked, she decided to reach out to the CUNY Institutional Review Board for help. Marome contacted me and said, I am a father of two toddlers. I can't, my wife and I feel compelled to help you. We can't believe this is still a thing. My lab at the City College of New York focuses on the development of medical devices. So we were able to contribute to Grace's vision to create a toddler cane by using the resources we have here to rapidly design and prototype medical devices. We were able to accelerate the creation of the toddler cane. So for fast uh, prototyping, uh, we use 3D printers and we 3D print all of these uh, plastic parts. Toddler's body are very small, so it needs to be lightweight and at the same time it should uh, tolerate the impacts and it should be able to resist rough surfaces like cement or asphalt. Whenever you want, you can connect it to the rest of the frame or the detach it. The cane is custom made for each child and the team of Safe Toddles continue to research ways they can improve their design by monitoring each child's use of the cane. The first thing that we started to see on every child is the running, which when you work with kids who are visually impaired, you never see them run. And they run only if really coaxed and, and only if someone is holding on to them. So that was, a, when we first saw it in the first child who wore it, we thought, well, he's a four-year-old boy, and but his mother said, I've never seen him run before. They do blossom very quickly. Their body straightens up, their language gets better, and uh, they start playing. We have put in for phase two, which is a two-year project to not only perfect the design of the cane, but also to create an computer application that would allow for data collection as well as uh, provide lesson examples and um, ways to help people integrate it into their daily routines. The toddler cane, we believe, is something that every visually impaired child has a right to. And for that reason, we've decided to provide these canes for free. For people who care about our mission and want to support this project, they can go to safetoddles.org and they can actually donate a kid a, a cane. So you can make a donation, you can buy one cane, you can in fact buy a whole school a bunch of canes. The toddler cane is a critical tool to give these children the confidence they need to be safe and safety is development for these kids. I'm Mari of Amy for Science and You. Oh my goodness. On this day in science, June 6, 1822. On June 6, 1822, Alexis St. Martin was accidentally shot in the stomach. St. Martin was treated by Dr. William Beaumont, a surgeon. While Dr. Beaumont didn't expect St. Martin to survive, he did. And as a result, Beaumont conducted numerous experiments on St. Martin's digestive system, using his open wound as a portal. Beaumont wanted to prove that the digestive process was more chemical-based than mechanical and conducted various studies on gastric juice samples from St. Martin. Last month in science, Hawaii's Kilauea volcano began spewing destructive lava with plumes reaching more than five miles high. This new eruption resulted from the collapse of a crater that was filled with molten lava. Kilauea has been in a state of constant eruption since 1983. UCLA scientists are regrowing neurons in the brains of test mice using a new stroke healing gel. 
The gel works by creating an infrastructure for blood vessels and neurons to grow and is infused with medications that stimulate blood vessel growth and subdue inflammation. This could be a major breakthrough for human stroke victims with both immediate injuries as well as long-term consequences of stroke. Researchers at Yale University are studying how stars are born by mapping Orion A, the closest star-forming region with stars similar to our Sun. This map will help researchers all over the world better understand how our own Sun formed and also help scientists understand the star evolutionary process. Nanoparticles may soon be used to help struggling crops grow. These particles, known as liposomes, are hollow spheres approximately 100 nanometers in diameter. They are made from a soybean extract. Scientists began filling the spheres with fertilizing nutrients, which are then sprayed onto a crop, soaking the plant leaves, and finally delivering nutrients to malnourished plants. That's our show for today. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Magalie Laguerre-Wilkinson. We'll see you next time on Science and You.